Welcome to another week of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture Seminar Series. The listing for the rest of the quarter is up on our website at beth.ucla.edu. And um, as a reminder, we have a couple of extra talks that are not going to be on Mondays. Um, one, I think, is on a Friday, and the other is on a Wednesday. Um, so those are going to be the end of February and the beginning of March, so coming up pretty soon. Uh, for next week, we have Brian Wood coming from the Stanford Department of Anthropology, and he's going to be talking about household and kin provisioning by Hadza Males. So be sure to be here for that. And uh, this week, I'm happy to welcome Derek Lyons from uh, UC Irvine, and he's going to be talking about the social roots of artifact culture. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon um, uh, to talk about over imitation. So um, I'm going to start with um, what, at least for developmental psychologists, is an uncontroversial assertion. Um, and that is that children really are nature's imitative masterpieces. Children are extremely adept, not only at absorbing all kinds of knowledge just by watching um, the actions of other people, but what's really even more striking is that in general they're very good at doing this in a way that's quite selective. So there's a whole battery of research over the years showing that even from 18, 17, 14 months of age, um, kids aren't blind copiers. So if they're observing somebody doing something, they can use information like that person's goals, physical constraints that might be acting on that person, um, really high level information to filter the information that they're taking in and then when they copy, they're only copying the parts that are relevant to um, their own situation. So in general, they're very rational and selective about the things that they imitate. Um, but that's not always the case, um, which we're going to talk about now. So here's an interesting object. This is a, a puzzle creation that we call the monkey box. Um, and there's a little four-year-old boy. You can just see his shoes on the right side of the frame there. Um, and he's been told that there's a little toy turtle somewhere inside this monkey box. So what he's going to do is just watch as this adult experimenter um, goes about retrieving this turtle. Now, if you look at the box from um, the perspective that the child has on it, there shouldn't be too much mystery about where this turtle is located, right? Um, the most obvious and salient feature is this really bright red door on the front. Um, there's only one part of the object that's opaque that could contain it, this, this silver tube that you see running up um, behind the door. It runs through the center of the object. So um, just a quick visual appraisal would lead one to assume that that's probably where the turtle is. Um, and in fact, that's correct. Um, when the experimenter, Diana, goes about retrieving the turtle, though, she's not going to do it in quite the way you would imagine. She's going to start by doing a bunch of things that aren't really necessary, like this tapping. Now she's pulling out this irrelevant bolt and tapping inside the empty upper half of the object. And only after all of that unnecessary wind up does she do the thing that's necessary, which is just to take the door off um, and reach in to pull the turtle out. He's on a little ribbon there, as you can see. So here's a question for our collective intuition about four-year-olds. When the child has a chance to retrieve this turtle for himself, and we'll assume that Diana's going to leave the room so there's no overt uh, monitoring or, or somebody directly observing the kid, how do we think that he's going to try to do this? Well, we were just talking a moment ago about the fact that kids are usually very selective in what they copy and that they'll tend to filter out things that aren't appropriate or aren't relevant for their situation. Um, there's an even more direct piece of evidence uh, that we can use to predict in this case, though. And that is that Andy Whiten and his colleagues uh, at St. Andrews have done this very study with chimpanzees. Um, and what they found was really quite striking, I think, is that 80% of chimps when you put them in this exact same situation, will only do the things that are necessary. So they won't copy all of that top tapping and pulling out the bolt on top of the object. So if anything, we'd think that kids are probably going to uh, be at least as clever in this task. In fact, though, um, that's not quite what happens, as we'll see here in this little clip. Um, when the child starts going after the turtle, and again, he's by himself now, he's going to start by copying very carefully all of the unnecessary stuff. So there goes that bolt that's really relevant, and we're going to do the tapping. Um, and only after that comes the part that's presumably rewarding um, here, which is to get out this little turtle. So it's this phenomenon right here that we're calling over-imitation. It's this tendency of young kids, and these are three to five-year-olds or preschoolers that we're going to be talking about today, to very, very persistently copy the actions that they see an adult 
purposely performing on novel objects, even when the irrelevance of those actions is visually apparent uh, from the transparency of the object itself. <coughs> so the question that we're going to ask quite simply is, well, well, what does this mean exactly? Why is it the kids are over-imitating in this circumstance? Um, and you know, when I started looking into the literature on this, you can go back um, at least 15, 16 years in the literature and still and find reports of over-imitation like phenomena that usually crop up in the context of studies that are investigating something else. And they're just sort of um, briefly commented on, um, and no one really investigated it. And I think the reason for that is that there's a couple of really plausible um, ideas that suggest themselves about why kids might be copying these unnecessary actions. Um, so for one, uh, there's a the strong um, recognition in, in psychology that imitation is, especially for young kids, as much an act of uh, social engagement or communication as it is a mechanism for learning. So one very plausible explanation is that what we're seeing here is just the social end of that imitative continuum. And that the kids are copying these unnecessary actions not because they're confused in any kind of interesting way, um, but just because they're more interested in kind of playing along with the model or continuing the engagement, being like the adult, um, as Nielsen has argued in some of his papers. Um, an alternative that's uh, related but somewhat different comes from the way some of these prior studies were done. So in the Horner and Whiten um, study with the chimpanzees that I was just mentioning, they also did a very quick comparison with kids. Um, it only involved about 12 uh, preschoolers, so it was very much uh, a sidelight in, in that um, comparative paper. Um, but what they found was that the kids over-imitate, and uh, it was hard to draw any conclusions from <coughs> that paper, though, um, because in order to make this work for chimps, they had, the chimps had to watch the adult repeat the sequence of actions three times in a row. So they did the same thing for the kids. And you can well imagine that as a, a three or four year old, if you're watching an adult opening an object in some kind of stylized way, and then he resets it, and then he opens it again, and then he resets it, and so on three times in a row, that there's a very strong demand here to do it like so, right? There's an implicit um, task demand that's urging you to copy these unnecessary actions. So maybe that's what's driving it. Um, the thing that all of these accounts and a bunch of others that I won't get into, various permutations on these themes have in common, um, is that they all assume that, again, the kids are not confused in this situation, right? That they're not uh, knowingly, uh, well, they are knowingly copying unnecessary actions. They're not confused about the causal relevance or real irrelevance of the actions that they observe, and that they're choosing to copy things that aren't necessary for social or pragmatic reasons. Um, if this is true, then it makes a pretty crisp assumption or a pretty crisp prediction, um, which is that it should be easy to get kids to stop. Them, right? You could imagine that if they're only copying for these social or strategic reasons, if we just taught kids or train them that in this particular setting you're not supposed to copy things that you don't have to do, that that should break the effect pretty readily. Um, so this is the the prediction of these voluntary accounts, but it hadn't been tested until a couple of years ago. Um, and we decided to uh, investigate this to see whether that strong prediction will actually hold. Um, so the procedure for our original study is um, very much what I was just alluding to, where we're going to first train kids um, to, one, pay attention to the difference between relevant and irrelevant actions. We're going to train them that copying the irrelevant actions in this context isn't, uh, isn't good, isn't useful. Um, and the way that we did that was to have a fairly lengthy kind of pre-experiment training phase where we took a bunch of really simple household objects, things that kids are familiar with. This is just a flower jar, um, and it has a little toy dinosaur on the bottom. That's what that green blob is down there. Um, and what the kids did was that they watched the experimenter um, retrieve the dinosaur from the container, um, but he added in some irrelevant steps. So in this case, the experimenter would tap on the jar with the feather and then unscrew the lid and take the dinosaur out. Um, and after observing this, the experimenter would just ask the child, which of these <coughs> things did I have to do? Um, and when the child was correct about identifying the irrelevant action as silly or unnecessary, then they were praised and, and reinforced, and that was um, made to be a good thing. So here's just a quick example of how this training looks with um, this little guy here. Okay, there he is. So Josh 
Did I have to tap on the jar with this feather to get the next row? No. No? Did I have to take off this lid? Yeah. You're right. So you know what? That's what this game is about. Sometimes I'm going to do silly things like tapping on the jar with the feather, things that don't really help me get the dinosaur. And I want you to watch really carefully so you can tell me what they are, okay? Okay. Okay, let's do that. Okay. So that's the basic idea. And now for each of these um, preschoolers, we do this not just once or twice, but in fact, eight times in a row with eight different objects, um, eight different examples of things that you don't have to do in opening them, except for one control item where the two actions are necessary to make sure they're not just falling into a habit of saying yes to, no, uh, yes to one and no to the other. So for a four-year-old, this is the equivalent of like a semester-long class on causal reasoning. It's really intense for them to get through this like <laughs> over and over again with these objects. Um, but what we're doing here is, by the time this is done, 15 minutes later, it's really crystal clear to these kids that we're, for whatever reason, very uh, interested in the difference between things you have to do and things you don't have to do. Um, that it's not good to do things you don't have to do. And that the experimenter is this kind of weirdly unreliable model. So he's always doing stuff that he doesn't have to do. So immediately following this training, um, we then go into the, the observation phase of the study, where the kids are going to see um, to a first approximation exactly what they saw during training. That is, it's the same adult, um, and again, he's opening an object using some actions that are necessary and some actions that aren't. Um, and so here again, just to recapitulate the things that aren't necessary in the monkey box with all this tapping and taking out the bolt. Um, and then the adult is going to leave the room, and the question is whether after this training, kids are still going to over-imitate or whether, as the voluntary <coughs> accounts of over-imitation would predict, um, that the effect is going to fall away. Well, we've done this now with um, a variety of different objects, and I won't talk about them all in detail. They're all uh, predominantly <coughs> transparent, so made from plexiglass and plastic, so it's easy to see which mechanisms are doing something and which are not. Um, each of them has one thing that's necessary, like a door or a cover on the turtle container. Um, and they each have one thing that's not, like these irrelevant bolts. Uh, I know it's, it's hard to tell from looking at um, these small images of these, but these objects are very, very simple when you see them in person full size. Um, and we know that empirically because we do um, a baseline condition where we give these objects to kids in this age group, age-matched kids, um, and we just say there's a turtle in here, and I want you to figure out how to get it out. And then what we measure in graph here are the proportion of kids who, who perform irrelevant actions in the course of retrieving the turtle. So the first time kids lay eye on, eyes on these objects, you know, they look at it for a couple seconds while the adult's talking, they open it, and for the monkey box, it's only a little over 1 in 10 kids will do anything that's unnecessary in the course of opening it. So these really are quite simple. Now, the question is, how does this change after kids have gone through this training and watched an adult opening the object inefficiently just once? Um, and the answer is it changes really quite radically, actually. Um, now, the, this, this data is still really striking to me as a developmental psychologist. The total uh, N here, the total number of participants represented in this graph is close to 400. Um, so this is a very robust effect where you have more than 90% of 400 three to five year olds will copy the irrelevant actions after they see the adult um, performing them once, even though they've been trained to ignore um, the silly extra things that the adult's doing. Um, what's important to note is that the likelihood of over imitation here is actually totally independent of the score on that training measure. So the kids who ace the training, who go through all eight of those familiar objects and never have trouble identifying the irrelevant actions, are just as likely to over imitate on a novel object as the kids who find the training more difficult. Now, we were surprised by this, so we, you know, of course, did some follow-ups in the first study, and, and one of them was just to really say, well, okay, that worked better than we were expecting, so what if we just tell kids, maybe it's just not explicit enough, so let's just tell them right before they act that they're not supposed to do things that aren't necessary. Um, and we, you know, to, to sort of get around the fact that some three-year-olds aren't as verbal as fours and fives, we do this very explicitly by referencing the first training object and saying, okay, see this jar again, do you remember how I did this silly tapping with the feather when I opened this? Well, when I'm opening these next objects, I might do something that's silly and extra just like the feather was. And if you see me do any of those things, don't do it. You're not supposed to do it. Don't copy things you don't have to do. 
Um, and the, uh, the output of that was very similar to what we saw before. So it, it depresses it very slightly, nothing statistically significant, and we still see overimitation preserved in a really um, striking way. So um, to take stock of where we are so far, um, I hope that this initial data starts to uh, convince you a little bit that these voluntary accounts of overimitation as being just a social game that kids are playing or a kind of pragmatic response um, doesn't really seem to rise to the robustness of the data. So uh, overimitation will persist even when we train kids not to do it. You can tell kids not to do it as explicitly as you'd like. Um, and the, the experiment that I'm really fond of but um, haven't talked about yet, that you can actually end the experiment. So we've done uh, several covert experiments, as we call them, where the, uh, the study is presented to the children is over, the game's done, great, you get a prize, and then sort of incidentally on their way out, there's uh, a situation that arises where they need to help open one of the objects to check whether something's in them or something like that. Um, so in this kind of real world situation, um, they still over imitate. So it's very hard to get kids to not do it. Okay, so if the social and voluntary accounts of over imitation are out, uh, or at least seem to be on their way out from my perspective, the question is what's going to replace them? So what, what other alternative do we have to explain why kids respond in this way? Um, and our thinking about this was really shaped by some early piloting that we did with uh, kids where we would just ask them to sort of try and verbalize, explain what they're thinking about these objects as well as they're able to. So the kid I'm going to show you on the next slide, it's actually a different child, but same object, has just watched the adult open this object that we call the Thunderdome. Um, and the way the adult opens it is, uh, starts by moving this blocking piece and flipping up the lid, so the turtle is now accessible. Um, but then he does this uh, removing a, a screwdriver bolt that's sort of stuck loose inside the plastic container there. And there comes the turtle. Um, and after having watched this, we're just going to go through these actions with the child and ask him to explain what he thinks um, about each of these actions. So Josh, in order to get the turtle, did I have to turn this out of the way to get the turtle? Well, you tapped it. Oh, I had to tap it? Yeah. And then did I have to turn it? Yeah. Okay, and did I have to go like this to get the turtle? Did I have to pull this out? If I didn't pull that out, could I still get the turtle? No? How come? It would be stuck in there? Yeah. So this was really striking to us. And you might recognize this kid. He's the same one that was in the example of the training who had no trouble identifying the feather tapping. Is like, oh, no, that's silly. You don't have to do that. Um, but having just watched the adult open this novel object in a kind of weird way once, he's now really adamant and convinced that if you don't take out this screwdriver bolt that's just sort of wiggling loose inside the plastic container, um, that the turtle's going to be stuck and it won't come out. Well, we got enough responses like that, um, that we really started to take them seriously and, and wonder whether this might actually be what was going on. Um, and over time, what this led us to propose is what I'm calling the automatic causal encoding hypothesis. Now, the idea here is that when children are confronted with novel objects, like the monkey box, so things that they're not familiar with, um, and they see an adult acting on them in a purposeful or intentional manner, um, that perhaps what they're doing is, without really realizing it, they're kind of automatically encoding all of the actions that the adult performs on purpose as being causally meaningful or causally important. So the idea is that when the child is done watching the experimenter, he doesn't think or feel as though he's seen some actions that were necessary and some that aren't. He's entered this kind of extremely receptive pedagogical mode where all of the actions are immediately just encoded and solidified as being causally important. We argue that what happens is that this actually rewires, in some respect, their causal theory of how this particular <coughs> object works, so that the, the actions, uh, they infer from the actions to causal structure. So they really do think these actions are <coughs> necessary, having seen them enacted purposely on this novel gizmo. Um, now, this seems like kind of a far-out idea the first time uh, you hear it, right? Um, but it's worth noting that this is something that we as adults do all the time. So, uh, for example, my dad's an auto mechanic, and I know very little about cars. So if he's trying to explain something to me about the way the car works, 
let's say he's going to take that red cap off on the right for some reason. If, imagine if he loosens some bolt over on the left before he uncaps the red container on the right. If I ever have to repeat that operation myself, um, you can bet that I'm going to loosen the thing on the left before I take the cap off, right? I might not know why. There might not be any visual evidence to suggest that they're linked or that they're, uh, they tie together in an important way. But I infer that because he's more knowledgeable than me, because he's doing it on purpose, that they must cohere. So in, in, in essence, I'm rewiring my very impoverished causal theory of a car's engine to incorporate those elements that I saw him performing on purpose. Now, the idea with automatic causal encoding is simply that kids do the same thing. Um, our, the real contention that's different from adults, though, is that they do it very automatically. It's not a deliberate strategy on the part of kids at this age. It just happens, and they're left with this revised theory of, of the object. So that's the theory. That's, that's what I want to try and convince you of. Um, how are we going to test that? Well, it actually sets up really nicely in opposition to these voluntary accounts of over-imitation that we talked about earlier. So just as these, the voluntary accounts predict it should be very easy to get kids to stop over-imitating, you can just teach them not to do it, tell them it's not appropriate, the causal encoding account, um, contrastingly, uh, argues that over-imitation should be very persistent, should be really tough to get kids to disengage from copying these actions. In fact, they should persist even when it's kind of costly. <coughs> Um, or has some sort of uh, negative effect on, on uh, another goal that they might be trying to reach. So uh, the question that we asked in, in setting up a follow-up experiment was, well, how can we make over-imitation into a costly option? How can we make it something that uh, kids really have to bear um, a, a cost in order to enact? Um, well, the idea that we hit upon for this um, is actually a pretty simple one, and that's to bring in an element of competition. So competition. Um, is actually something that preschoolers are well acquainted with by the time they're three years old. You can just go to a preschool and watch the daily routine. Um, there's competition embedded all throughout the day and being the first to put on your coat, being the first to get in line for recess, um, etc. So it's really salient, even from the time they're three years old. Um, and more uh, formally, with experiments that uh, developmental psychologists have done, if you show kids in preschool a picture like this, it's a little bit ambiguous about what's happening, and ask them to describe it, um, kids will tend to spontaneously describe images like this in competitive terms. So they'll say, well, they're having a race, or she's winning and he's losing. Um, so it's really at the forefront of, of, uh, of their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and also just an important note about motivation. We know with adults that things like competition, these extrinsic motivators can have kind of a corrosive effect on intrinsic motivation. Um, but what's really interesting is that for preschoolers, that doesn't seem to be true. Um, probably because their sense of what it means to have an ability or be good at something is very different from ours. Um, preschoolers' interest in motivation is actually enhanced by competition as opposed to being slowly eroded um, in the way that it is for adults. So it's salient, it's something they care about, it's good for their interest in motivation. Um, it seems like a good thing to use to really uh, try and test this automatic causal encoding account as, as stringent <coughs> as we can. So if you look at the monkey box um, more closely from the side, you can see that we actually designed it with this kind of competitive design um, in mind from the start. So it's symmetrical around this horizontal midline. So imagine if you had a competitor on the opposite side of the box, the two of you could have a little race to see who could open it the most quickly um, to get a single turtle who's going to be um, sitting right in the center there out. Um, so this is what we're going to have kids do. They're going to have this race now to see who can open it most quickly. Um, and we decided that for reasons of experimental control, um, we were going to have them race against this handsome guy, Felix the orangutan, rather than another child. So Felix is going to be their competitor. Um, and the procedure is going to be very similar at the start to what we talked about before, where they start with this training. Um, we actually enhance the training a little bit, but I won't, won't talk about the specifics there. Um, they're then going to observe the adult opening one of these novel objects. And then they're going to have a race with Felix to see who can open this box. The most quickly, yeah. Are they told that they can do anything to open the box, or mm -hmm. are they told um, just that they have to do what they see? Um, they're told that they can do anything, and there's actually a second experiment that's going to address that even more directly. Um, right, so stay tuned. Uh, so they're going to have a race with Felix. Now, the unfortunate thing for the kids is that the race is actually rigged in an important way, and that's simply that if you over-imitate, then you're going to lose. 
Um, but we're going to give them three tries. So they have three tries in a row, increasing amount of experience with the object to get this right. And the prediction, our prediction for automatic causal encoding, is that even as this competitive pressure sort of escalates over time, that they should stay tied to these irrelevant actions. It should be very hard for them to start filtering them out. So how does Felix uh, is actually, he lives in this bamboo cabana that we carted around to preschools. Um, and he's controlled with sort of armatures and like a, a little platform that he sits on by an experimenter who's hidden in the cabana. There's a closed circuit video camera so that the experimenter in the cabana sees what the child's doing and can interact contingently with Felix. Um, so it's a pretty elaborate design that really um, is really compelling. I have some examples in a minute, but um, they definitely love and respond to Felix um, as though he were an um, inanimate creature. So, um, so it's, it's a fun experiment to do. Um, so we train them as before. They observe the same thing that they um, had seen before with the adult opening the object in this kind of wacky way. Um, and then this gets to what you were just asking. Before the competition, we of course have to introduce Felix to the child, right? Um, so I'm going to show you that, uh, take a minute to show you how that works in real time, because this is very important. It's about like, you know, them making the connection with the competitor. Um, and also, do they understand the competitive nature of the task? So we have to ascertain that they really get the idea of the race here. Oh, and he's not a monkey. Yeah, of course. Uh, yes, that's exactly. So kids have very strong, very strong intuitions that Felix is a monkey. Um, so for the purposes of our nomenclature, we decided to just go with it. Okay, so here's the introduction of Felix. Well, now you're going to meet a monkey. How do you feel about that? Also named Felix. That's pretty cool. Well, Felix lives in this house right here. So you know what? I bet if you call his name, he'll come out. You want to call Felix? Go ahead. But you have to stay on your cushion because he's kind of shy when he meets new people. Felix! He's home here? Felix, you want to come out? Hi, Felix! Oh, hi, Felix! Oh, 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 Felix, he's cool, huh? You ever see a monkey like him before? Yeah, he's he's a great monkey. Yeah, he's he's pretty cool, huh? You know what Felix's favorite thing to do is in the whole world? He loves to play this game. You want me to show you how it works? All right. Well, remember what your side of the toy looked like over here? Well, let's look at Felix's side. Felix's side looks just like your side, doesn't it? They're exactly the same. Well, that is so that you and Felix can both try to get the turtle out at the same time. So it's like a race. You're going to try to get the turtle from this side, and he's going to try to get it from that side. Okay. So how many turtles are there going to be inside the toy? One. One, that's right. So if he gets it out, I'm going to Okay. Okay. So there's the introduction, very important. You can see that there's this little manipulation check at the end there to make sure that they've really got it. There's only one turtle, it's a race, it's competitive, so if Felix gets it, you're not going to win. I um, mean, kids have no trouble with that. They very seldom need any clarification about the idea. So after this introduction of Felix, um, we're now going to get into going to the races here. Um, we're gonna watch this particular participant as he goes through his series of three tries with Felix. Um, and remember, it's, it's a rigged competition, so if you over-imitate, then you lose, but you're going to have another try to get it right. So let's see how he approaches this. So you hold this, but don't go until I say, okay? I'm going to count to three, and then you can go. Felix, do you want to start yet? All right. Okay, so I'm going to start yet. All right, now I'm going to go count to three, okay? One, two, three. Hey Felix, do you have a turtle? What? Oh my gosh, he does have the turtle. Wow. Okay. So there's his first race. Um, the uh, he, he, you can see that he seems like he's trying to do it pretty quickly. Um, in general, they're about twice as fast during the, the first race as they are when they have a trial run non-competitively, so they definitely speed up. 
Um, but now he's realized that this is serious, right? Because Felix is good, um, he's practiced, and he, he won. Um, so he's going to have another chance immediately following this. And these just happen boom, 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 one after the other. Um, so we'll see how he does in the second try. All right, one, two, three, go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I mean, his his personal best has improved quite a bit, more than twice as fast the second time. Um, but what's really striking as adults is that, well, he's I mean, he's clearly trying to hurry. Um, he's sped up quite a bit, but he's still not doing the thing that should be the most obvious thing, which is just to stop with the actions that don't have any causal importance. Um, and then just to finish this out, here's his last trial. We do let every kid wins on the last trial regardless of what they do. Um, so he will get the turtle at the end of this. But let's see if he persists in the over One, two, three, go. Go! <laughs> oh, victory! You beat Felix! Okay. So, fatigue is starting to set in, it's a little slower, but um, he, he does get the turtle. So here's how the data looks for this. Um, the baseline for uh, the amount of irrelevant action production that we see when kids do this without watching an adult, here's the degree of over imitation that we see when this is presented non-competitively. Now, when we introduce the competition, we do see, for the first time, a decrement in over imitation. So this is significantly less than uh, in the non-competitive phase. So it's possible that at least some of the kids initially um, are over imitating for uh, social reasons. However, what's really interesting is that as the competition wears on, most of the kids remain stuck. So by the end of the trial, when they've had actually three races in one practice or four um, <coughs> tries to open this object as quickly as they can, most kids um, are remaining stuck in over imitation. It's more than three and a half times what we see at baseline. And again, this is independent of um, their training score. So um, I want to argue, of course, that this is this is good for our theory. Uh, oh, we have a little. Yes, we won again. No way! Can I So I want to argue that this is, this is good for our theory. The fact that over imitation persists despite this competition um, supports our idea that they've encoded these actions is really causally important. But there's an alternative that's especially important to take account of in this case, and this gets back to your point, which is that maybe kids aren't understanding the game in the way that we want them to. So it's possible that rather than um, construing this as a race in which the goal is just to get into the object as quickly as you can, they might be thinking that it's a kind of first A, then B, then C, then D thing, then get the turtle. And you're supposed to do all of that as quickly as you can. And if that's true, then all bets are off, and they're over-imitating for reasons that aren't as interesting as we'd like to um, argue that they are. So we think that's unlikely for a couple of reasons. One has to do with the way we restructured the training, so they actually get practice inhibiting copying rather than just responding verbally. Um, the second. I, I think this is interesting. People quibble about whether it's something a kid would notice. But you'll note that when the race is over, the child in that last clip, for example, is like, oh, I'll put my bolt back in. And Felix's bolt is always sitting there. It's never out. So I mean, if you were a very observant five-year-old, you might notice that Felix is not doing this. And no one ever argues that, it's, that he's cheating or that it's not fair. But uh, aside from those points, it remains a very important objection. And we wanted to address it really squarely. Um, so that uh, it was the genesis of this, a kind of covert experiment that we did on the uh, heels of the Felix experiment. Now it's covert because uh, it's presented to the child as though the, the game per se is over. So the experimenter uh, says, great, you did so well racing Felix, congratulations, and you're going to get a prize to take home with you because you did such a good job in my game. 
Um, he then is going to bring in this box, which is the prize box. Um, it's not presented to the kids as this is the next part of the game. It just happens to be where the experimenter keeps his prizes. Um, and as he opens this, um, without particular commentary, you're going to see that he, uh, the experimenter incorporates irrelevant actions into the way that he gets the prize out of the container. Okay, Gary, this is the box where we keep our prizes. Okay, so the irrelevant action is just the swinging of the arm from uh, right to left. In this case, it's noisy because it has this jingly bell attached to it. Uh, and there comes the glow-in-the-dark bracelet that's going to be the kid's prize. Um, kids just love these glow-in-the-dark bracelets. Um, so the kid is sort of inspecting the bracelet, trying it on, um, and then there's this kind of shocking turn of events that takes place. It's like a little bracelet thing, right? Yeah. Oh, I hear Felix. Hey, Felix! What's going on? Oh, you want to see Garrett's prize? Can I show him your prize? Okay, be nice, Felix. Let's look, because Garrett, Garrett won Garrett's prize. Very nice prize, huh? Nice. Oh, Felix! Oh, gosh, he took your prize! Okay, so no one sees that one coming. In the experiment. Um, so the kid at this point is usually a little, doesn't quite know what to make of it. They're not happy, <laughs> like the, the bracelet is gone. Um, but the experimenter has a, a plan that he's going to propose for the child. Okay. So here's the thing. I think what happens is this. We will feel So this is the setup. The experimenter now, to facilitate the illusion that everyone has gone home, is going to actually leave the room. Um, so the child is left by themselves, a couple feet away from Felix, with the prize box sitting in between them. Um, and the question, of course, uh, is are they still going to do the over-imitation action, which in this case is the only part of opening the prize box that made an appreciable amount of noise. Um, and it's, you know, it, this is actually... We, we meant this to be a, a fun thing, and I think it was, but it was very intense for like the three and four year old to go through this. Um, so they often require a little reassurance before the experimenter leaves the room. Um, they're, they're a little unsure at first. Um, so they take it very seriously. They're really focused on like, okay, how am I going to get this prize out without alerting the orangutan? Um, and here's the way this girl approaches it, and she's just being kind of quiet and sneaky. Um, if you wash her hand as it comes around here, you'll see that she's actually muffling the bell with her hand. So she's very conscious of like the, the sort of the noise issue. Um, but of course she's still performing the unnecessary action. And she's going to take a really, really, really long time to unzip it tooth by tooth so it doesn't make any sound um, to get the prize out. So they clearly take it seriously, but they're still, even in this um, fairly charged real world setting um, <coughs> for a preschooler, they're still copying these unnecessary steps. So here's how the data um, looks for this overall. Um, the bracketing data is the, we have the non-competitive over-imitation, um, the baseline for this object when kids open it independently without watching an adult. Um, and the really exciting thing for us is that in the covert condition, um, it actually doesn't differ statistically from the non-competitive condition, and it's very strong relative to baseline, almost nine times as high. Um, so they're really sticking with over imitation even in a, a kind of um, intense competitive situation. But they still like Felix. Oh. Okay. Okay. So um, to sum up these competitive studies, what, what I want to argue is that even uh, fairly extreme competitive pressure is insufficient to block the effect. Um, and our construal of this is that in combination with the prior work, we see this supporting this automatic causal encoding account. The kids have a hard time dropping out the unnecessary actions because in general, they've already encoded them as part of that object's causal structure. Well, there's a little bit of a gotcha at this point in the data, in the sense that, okay, so over imitation is very, very robust. Um, it's defeating all of these challenges that we've put up against it. 
But the, the observation, of course, is that kids don't normally make these kinds of mistakes, right? So how can these two things exist side by side? <coughs> kids are interacting with objects that are much more complicated than our transparent puzzle boxes. Why do we not see overimitation in the wild if they're really uh, so willing to encode purposeful actions causally important? Well, either the theory is wrong or there have to be some kind of constraints. Um, there have to be some sort of boundary conditions that confine this automatic causal encoding process in a way that makes it um, into something that operates when it's likely to be beneficial rather than in settings where it would tend to undermine kids' causal understanding. I'm going to talk in this last 10 minutes um, about two categories of constraints that we've investigated, um, physical and social. On the physical side, we'll talk about core knowledge um, constraints, and then um, the one that I really like is the intentionality constraints. So just to start with, core knowledge, um, we've seen, of course, at this point that um, kids' physical intuitions are much more malleable than we might have supposed. Um, but are there limits to this malleability? So are there some irrelevant actions that are just so far out there that, know that they're not going to causally encode them? And when we started thinking about this, what we wanted to focus on was this uh, domain of what's called core knowledge in developmental psychology, um, proposed in the early 90s by Liz Spelke and her collaborators. Um, and just in a very quick nutshell, the idea with core knowledge is that when infants come into the world, they have a, um, a small kernel of uh, physical intuition that's basically hardwired into the brain. And it's this core knowledge that helps to kind of structure their interpretation of, of physical events from uh, the earliest ages. One um, example of this is the idea of a, a connectedness principle or a contact principle, which is um, if you think about billiard balls colliding <coughs> with each other, um, we, if, you show that, if you show a display like that to infants except the balls don't actually touch, they just react as though they're colliding without striking each other, um, even from three months of age, kids will regard that as an anomalous event spontaneously without being habituated to anything. It just seems to be part of their endowment when they come into the world. Um, so no spooky action at a distance when you're three years or three months of age. Um, so we thought, okay, what if we made an irrelevant action that would have to violate the contact principle in order to be causally meaningful? Will that block automatic causal encoding? And, and now we're hoping that it will, of course, because if there are no constraints, our theory is in trouble. So we designed this object with that in mind. Um, it's a puzzle object with these two halves and a removable connector in the center. And basically, when the experimenter opens this object, he performs relevant actions on half of it and irrelevant actions on the other half. Um, so just really quickly, let's show you how that works. Um, the irrelevant action is uh, twisting around this little stake and sort of dropping it down into the container. Um, and then the relevant action is just uh, opening up the opposite half of the object to take out the turtle. <coughs> So half of the kids see, uh, well, all of the kids see those same actions. Half of them are in a group where this connector is in place when the experimenter does this, so the irrelevant and irrelevant actions are both on one continuous object. And half of them uh, see the same actions, but now the only difference is that that connector is gone, so that the actions are on two objects. Um, and what we found that's really fascinating, um, to me at least, is that in the connected condition, we see strong overimitation as before. Um, when you take away that connector, just that like you know one inch of plastic that's linking these two objects, now all of a sudden overimitation drops to in a significant degree. In fact, the remaining overimitation at baseline is not significantly different, or in, in the disconnected case, pardon me, is not significantly different from baseline. So it really knocks out the effect. Okay, so at least we have the, the idea that some forms of very, very foundational physical knowledge won't be overwritten by this causal encoding principle. Um, but I don't really think that's enough to do the work that we need it to do in this case. Um, if we're going to claim that this happens in the wild, there have to be more powerful constraints, um, not just these sort of far out ones. So that gets to intentionality. Um, now, in describing this so far in this talk, I've tried to be careful to be clear that we're talking about purposeful action, that the adults are intentionally performing on a novel object. And that intentionality is really central to the logic of the theory because, of course, if you're going to, it's the quality of intentionality that tells you that it's probably 
beneficial to infer from action to the theory of how the object works. So if you subtract that quality of intentionality, if kids continue to overimitate, that would be deeply problematic and maladaptive. So to make sure that that's not what happens, we did a study that looks like this. Um, the irrelevant actions in this case are even more kind of far-fetched. Um, so the waving of the paddle, knocking out the bolt, and opening up the door. So half of the kids see this, intentional. Um, the other half of the kids see the adult perform the same set of actions. So the actions don't differ. What differs is that they're embedded in a context that makes the irrelevant action seem unintentional. Um, so let me just show you how we accomplish that. So I'm going to get the turtle out and then you can make that sound good. Okay. Whoop. Hi, Mom. Uh huh. Oh, no, you can't find it? Oh, man. Um, let's see, did you look over by the doghouse, you know, on, on that side of the yard over there? not there. Oh, man. Did you look over on the other side of the yard by the tree? Um, you know, I really feel like I saw it over by the doghouse. Okay, well, I'll, I'll help you look when I get home. Okay. Okay, so same set of actions. Um, it's just in the context of this phone conversation now, the waving around and the knocking out of the bolt seems like something that's not what the experimenter intended to do. Um, so the data in this case um, is quite lovely, I think. We, here's the amount of overimitation that we see when those actions are intentional. And when they're unintentional, it really clobbers the effect. Um, drops all the way down to like literally equal to what we see in the baseline. Um, so the, the constraint of intentionality really does exercise this kind of circuit breaker like um, gating of the automatic causal encoding process. What's your feeling? sum up all of these studies, and we've gone through a lot of data quickly. But what I think this body of work suggests, what I'm hoping to convince you of, is that rather than being um, a pretty straightforward byproduct of social motivations, and task demands, um, of a kind of deliberate strategy that copying is probably better than not copying, um, it, none of those theories really seem sufficient to explain the depth of um, kids' dedication to overimitation. So what we've tried to do in this progression of work is to make the case that there may be this automatic causal encoding mechanism that's causing kids to absorb these intentional actions that they see performed on novel objects as causally meaningful. Um, and this is basically, as I said, the same thing that we as adults do. The thing that we think is different is that kids don't seem to have control of this process. It seems to be one that takes place um, regardless of whether it's costly, whether they're trying to be as efficient as possible, etc. Um, and it's that automaticity that then makes over-imitation, we think, so robust um, and so difficult to root out in these settings, um, except in cases where it kind of steps over the line of um, adaptivity, um, as we talked about with some of these boundary condition studies. Um, so that's the end of the data that I wanted to present today, and I just wanted to really thank and acknowledge my mentors at Yale, Frank Heil and Lori Santos. Um, and the various graduate students and friends who helped me um, run these studies. So, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure presenting this work, and I'm looking forward to discussing it. Thanks.